Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands, one of the deepest freshwater lakes in the world, over 20 miles long. So vast, every man, woman and child on the planet could fit into it three times over. And according to ancient legend, the abode of a huge and mysterious creature. For some 1500 years, there have been sightings here of a giant monster. The Loch Ness Submarine Company is just the latest of many attempts to explore the loch. The new sub can dive down to the bottom and tourists can book a ride. So what's in it for them? In concept, the ultimate monster hunt. We've had obviously many people over the years travel around Loch Ness, drive down the road, use their binoculars or cameras to try and see Nessie perhaps on the surface. Uh, other people travel by boat and cruise the loch trying to hope to perhaps see her as well. But no one as yet has actually been able to go down into the monster's den. And from an educational tourism point of view, we hope to offer uh, some adventure for a member of the public to actually dive down with us and also an educational dive that they can learn a bit about science while they're with us and learn a bit about the environment and Loch Ness itself. Do you really expect to see very much down there? It's very murky water, isn't it? It is indeed. It is certainly not the Caribbean, and I'm sure you wouldn't expect it to be. Uh, it is the deepest, darkest, blackest stretch of water possibly in the world, but it's got a tremendous mystique to it, and it's a very, very exciting location. And anybody who comes with us will have a, a very exciting time. The mountains around the loch rise to 2,000 feet. The first recorded sighting of the monster was in the 6th century by St. Columba. The first famous sighting of modern times was by a local Scot, Aldi Mackay. Her husband was driving her home from Inverness one afternoon in 1933. The loch was very flat as if you'd gone over it with an iron. And then suddenly, this thing came up. And I can see it still. <laughs> it just rose out of the water, black, wet, with the water rolling off it. And I yelled at my husband, stop, the beast. But of course he couldn't because he had to pay attention. And by the time he had stopped, the thing had gone underneath, back down again. And then it suddenly shot off to the far side of the loch, still in the narrow sort of dowry, and in a circle and round and down on the opposite. Aldi Mackay's sighting was to spark off an intense search for the monster. National newspapers scrambled for exclusives. Later that year, the Daily Mail sponsored an expedition led by one of the most famous hunters of the day, Marmaduke Wetherill. Loch Ness, on which the eyes of the world are focused, the reputed haunt of a prehistoric monster or monsters, and the newly found adventure ground of modern Gullivers. Mr. Wetherill, the big game hunter and his party, who have been hot on the trail of the monster for some time, set out from Foyers to comb the lake. There is competition from local enthusiasts, with ambitions to earn eternal fame for the discovery of a species long thought fabulous. Wetherill soon found what he said was the monster's footprint, overnight fame, but it was a hoax. The mark had been made by a stuffed hippo's foot owned by a local Scot. The world laughed at Marmaduke Wetherill, 
and at the very idea of the monster. But the legend lived on. The following year, a Harley Street surgeon claimed he was passing by when he saw a strange apparition on the loch. By chance, he had a camera with a telephoto lens. The so-called surgeon's photo became world famous overnight. But what was it? A giant sea serpent? An ancient dinosaur? Scientists were baffled and the sightings continued. I saw the head, the neck and the huge body which I'd say was about 30 feet long. And it was going sort of... Something like that. In my opinion, and I've studied it fairly closely, I think that it's some form of mollusk. Yes, it was the very same colour as an elephant. So who was right? The sceptics or the believers? Could the respectable surgeon be a hoaxer? Were the eyewitnesses all imagining things? The controversy went on for decades. And then in 1960, a sensational development. The first apparent sighting captured on film. An aeronautical engineer, Tim Dinsdale, had been monitoring the loch for just six days when he filmed this. It remains one of the most famous images ever taken on the loch. Was this V-shaped wake the monster's trail? Filmed from 1300 yards, the hump moves at about 10 miles per hour. Then it abruptly changes course and moves parallel to the shore. But could it be a boat? Anticipating that very question, Dinsdale also filmed a boat at a similar point on the loch. Photographic experts from the RAF later stated this was a boat about 13 meters long. But this was not a boat or submarine. It was, they said, probably a living creature, not less than six feet high and five feet wide, with a hump between 12 to 16 feet long. The film changed Dinsdale's life. He gave up his job to search for the monster. Over the years, he became the world's leading authority on it, devising his own special equipment to scan the loch. Well, essentially we have, of course, a cine camera with rather a special 10 to 1 zoom lens and enough film, it's colour film. It's electrically driven and it's a very exact uh, piece of mechanism. Uh, this sits on a rig, which I refer to as my Cyclops rig, which is a sort of all-can-do affair. One man is supposed to be able to do everything with this. Uh, to starboard here, we've got a parabolic dish reflector, which is really a sound collector. And this bounces the sound back to this very truthful microphone, which uh, in turn, we hope, records it on tape accurately. Uh, on this side, you've got a still camera, which I would use, I can use without looking at it. And this punctuates the cine film. Uh, I've got some new type of film in it, this infrared uh, color film, which produces a, a normal photographic image, but the colors are related to uh, infrared reflectance, I understand, and this would vary for different types of animals, which of course is important and interesting, I think. And up this end is a very bright light, an amazingly bright light, which at night I sight up on a rock or something, and I change cameras, I put on what I call my night camera, which has a special lens, and these are teed up together. So should I get a disturbance close up at night, which is what happened quite recently, uh, I step outside, you see, in theory, and turn the light on, and my light uh, sights the camera, and the camera is running, and you presumably get something. Dinsdale virtually lived on the loch, searching for the monster. After nearly a decade, what luck had he had? Well, most interestingly, uh, I haven't really had very much. I've missed it, I believe, on a couple of occasions by chance. I was there for a long time and then happened to go away and it was seen shortly afterwards. But this, I think, is the luck of the draw. And you mustn't give in to this. It's, the odds are very, very long on this. And one has to keep plugging away because there's a principle at stake here. I always think that uh, uh, we're defending the truth. When you've seen this thing, you, you have to decide on this issue. Are you going to stand and defend or fight? Or are you just going to shrug your shoulders and forget about it? Well, I made up my mind about this some years ago, and uh, we're still trying, you see. Dinsdale searched night and day till he died 26 years later. 
By then, he himself had become a legend to all monster hunters. He never did see the monster a second time, but he did have some alarming experiences. On this operation, I've been on the water now about seven weeks. I've been pretty close to it, I think. I've had a number of disturbances, wakes, uh, one at night, which I found very disturbing. What happened? One slightly frightening, actually. I was asleep in my bunk, and the boat was on calm water. It was jelly calm at night, and there were no boats, because you can hear boats. And I was awake, and then the boat started to rock, and I looked out of my window. I have four windows, which give me good visibility. And I saw this extraordinary disturbance, wake. You know what wakes look like when you live on the water. And this moved through the boat and rocked the boat about so much I almost fell out of bed, out of my, out of my bunk. And um, my reaction to this was one of, I really didn't want to look, you know, outside. I, I was a little, fri little afraid, I didn't mind admitting it. Because whatever created that wake was very large. Dinsdale was not alone in believing a huge monster might inhabit the loch. In 1969, three unidentified men made a large finding that excited the media and some of the experts. Mr. Taylor, you've had a, a brief look at this now, about five minutes. What do you make of it? Well, I think that this may well be a bone, uh, a very large bone, and uh, one's first impression is that this may be part of a femur of some large animal. Uh, what part's that? That's the uh, thigh bone. And uh, it's certainly a very large object. Um, I'm fairly certain that it is made of bone. What um, makes you think that? Well, the texture of the object, uh, its weight, and the fact that if you look very carefully at it, you will see what appears to be bone canals running throughout the structure of the object. It has the typical appearance of bone from which the organic matter has dissolved over a period of time, leaving just the ash intact. How old would you say it is? It's impossible to say, but it could be very, very old indeed. Was this bone from an ancestor of the monster photographed decades before by the Harley Street surgeon? The expert from Flamingo Park Zoo certainly seemed sure it was possible. Is there anything we should look at on the other side? Yes, if, if we look round here, at this point there appears to be what we would call a tuberosity, a, a muscle attachment uh, in the living animal. Certainly this has uh, many features uh, of the thigh bone of a vertebrate animal. You say it's only part of it. In fact, how big would the, would the complete bone be, do you think? Well, if this is a, is a femur, then we would expect there to be another half missing to this that should be looked for. I would think that the animal um, from which this came must have been perhaps 20 or 30 feet high. And, uh, of course, this depends very much on whether the animal uh, went on two or four legs. But there should be a, another piece, the other end, which w goes to the knee, which is at least as long and possibly twice as long as this particular bit that we have here. Enormous, enormous piece, yes. Would you be prepared now to bet that this object was part of an animal, having had just a quick look at it? Yes, I would put a small amount of money on it, that it is part of an animal. How interesting will it be if it turns out to be that? I part? think very interesting. Very interesting. Shortly afterwards, the find was proved to be a bone, but it was a blue whale's jawbone brought straight from a garden rockery in Yorkshire. The three nameless men who discovered it weren't the last hoaxers to visit Loch Ness. But what real chance is there any prehistoric monster might dwell in these deep, dark waters? The loch began to form 300 million years ago, when ancient Scotland split in two, creating a massive long trench. During the Ice Age, this deepened under the weight of glaciers 4,000 feet thick. Any prehistoric monster would have frozen to death. When the ice finally thawed around 12,000 years ago, the modern loch was born. But whatever is or is not in the loch, 
There have been over 1,400 sightings since the 1930s. Can so many people be wrong? While I was out fishing, it was really the month of March, the middle of March, and I was going up past this spot here, when I noticed some branches in the loch, and I found them outside line. So I tried to guide the boat so that the line would miss the branch, and when I looked out watching my line, I saw, just, saw this huge object out between the waves, going against the wind. And I knew right away it was uh, something very much alive. So I watched it, and I noticed quite close, a matter of 30 yards from it, I could even describe the colour of the skin. The skin was a sort of a dark brown, very, very rough, scaly. And up towards the shoulder, what I took to be the shoulder, the way it was going, against the wind, was this, what I took to be a mane. But it could be, it could be a flipper, it could be a fin or anything. How long was the object you saw? I, I would say 14 to 15 feet long. Pretty big? Pretty big, yes, pretty wide, I would say roughly four feet in width, you know, the, across, the, across the back. You didn't see any sign of a head? No head, no head or no tail, none whatsoever. Another Highlander out fishing saw something rather different in 1964. Later, a friend was to share a second sighting with him. I saw uh, a large object uh, came right out of the water in front of me. I was wading in the river fishing with fish, fly fishing, and when I got out onto the bank, by the time I got out to the bank, it, did, it had disappeared, but had reappeared over here and made its way along the side of the loch for about 50 to 60 yards, remained stationary for 10 to 15 minutes, and then took off in the direction of the other side of the loch at considerable speed, putting out a tremendous wave. You had a clear impression? Absolutely a clear, a clear view of the whole thing. Now, when you told the story to your friend, Mr. Cameron, he didn't believe it. Is that right, Mr. Cameron? I took the story with a pinch of salt. But a year later, you were both fishing here again. Now, what happened then? Well, on that occasion, we were fishing just on this spot here, and I went up to the point here to fish into the corner of the bay, and uh, Mr. Fraser was down at the barn, and I was casting across when I saw what I took to be uh, an upturned boat. The end-on view was like a boat because it had this sort of keel effect, but the side view came right up and then dropped down like a square head, almost like a, a hammerhead sort of thing, you see. So I became interested. I never thought of the monster at that time at all. It was quite too, uh, far from my thoughts, actually. What was the main impression you got from the thing you could see? Oh, the size, the, 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 the size of the, the object, because there must have been, it's difficult to say, but I would say 25 to 30 feet, and at the highest point, about five to six feet out of the water. What exactly did you see? So it was just a black mass, a large black mass. And uh, the, the, what I'm perfectly satisfied is that, uh, in the, that this was something, whatever it was, whatever you call it, was that it was able to overcome the wind. Because had it been subject to the wind, it would have landed at our feet here. How do you feel, Mr. Fraser, now, thinking back on it? What do you think you've seen? I've seen a large, unidentified object. I've fished here since I was uh, quite a young boy, and I've never seen anything like it in my life. While Mr. Fraser and Chief Inspector Cameron were on one side of the loch, a group of seven people were on the opposite shore. They also reported a clear view of the monster. So what are all these people seeing? Some experts believe the monster could be a giant sturgeon like this 14-footer found recently in the United States. Others believe people are seeing nothing but unusual wave formations, projecting their hopes and fears onto the waters of the ancient loch. Controversy grew by the year, and the world grew curiouser and curiouser. In 1962, the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau was formed to log sightings and film the monster. David James, a local MP, helped direct operations. And to get down to the elementary thing, the object of the exercise is surface photography. And we man our cameras up and down the loch throughout the whole fortnight. But you'll believe the most highly intensive two-week search that we have known up to date. Now, the majority of you 
are going to be manning cameras. Now, you, you, you've seen these cameras over here, and uh, they're all more or less like that. Uh, they may look terrifying, they're not. It's only the surface photography which could positively identify it. So this remains the most important leg of the operation and will remain so for all time. But the Bureau's mass film surveys came up with little new evidence of the monster. With one exception, footage shot by a 17-year-old enthusiast who was a keen follower of the legendary Tim Dinsdale. I'd been there 10 days uh, getting up at very early hours and it was a Tuesday of the second week and at about half past 11 in the morning when the lock was flat calm, not a ripple, uh, I saw a white line in the distance coming away from Dawes Bay towards Fort Augustus. I saw that with my, with my eyes. And through binoculars I could see a very small object sticking up at the front of that wake. And so at that point I climbed up onto the top of the Bedford van and started filming. And the film shows uh, principally a white line or water disturbance which is moving across the screen. And at part of, in part of the film, there's the pleasure boat Scott 2 comes into view in the foreground. It looks as though it's very close to the object I'm filming, but in fact it's half a mile uh, away from me, whereas the object is a whole mile away. Uh, nobody on the boat saw anything, but that's not surprising because they were very low down to the water. It was sent off uh, to London for processing first, and then when it was uh, looked at by the uh, directors of the Bureau, they felt it was worthwhile sending it to the RAF Photographic Interpretation Branch, which is called JARIC, and they analysed it many months later, during which time I was sworn to secrecy. And in their analysis they said that from time to time there appears to be something at the head of the wake, and a probable length for that object is in the order of seven feet which delighted me because there's nothing in Loch Ness that uh, is that long. Mystified by such sightings, scientists from all over the world began to join the search for the monster. Divers tested the latest underwater cameras. Food was prepared in the hope of enticing Nessie to the surface. We feel that this animal could not possibly be a vegetarian. There's no vegetable matter of any consequence in the loch, so we decided to make up a bait for a carnivorous animal, and we used uh, various uh, types of tasty and diffusible matter, which uh, we feel might attract a carnivore. Um, there's blood meal in here, um, mashed eels, um, anchovy paste, agar agar jelly, and also a hormone which we are trying uh, which we know does attract some species of reptile, just in case this uh, animal is a reptile, despite what I just said, and uh, it, indeed it might be attracted uh, to this bait through this hormone-like chemical. How are you going to use it? Well, we're going to uh, suspend it from a boy uh, in muslin bags, and also we're going to use it in a dry form, like this here, uh, scattered rather like rubby-dubby from the back of the boat. The bait was dropped into the loch, but no response from underwater. There was a subtler way of trying to detect the monster. Sonar sound waves. Scientists equipped their boat with the latest equipment. They then patrolled the loch, scanning its waters for signals suggesting Nessie was down there. But the monster eluded the scientists and their equipment. Cameras and sonar failed to find any strange large creature beneath the surface. Yet eyewitnesses kept spotting something on top. 
On the evening in question, without doubt, a ship like the prow of a Norwegian fishing vessel is sticking right out of the water. It had a small head, like a needle or a snake, magnified about 10, 15, 20 times. In the distance it was difficult to see. It stood erect out of the water and sailed right into our view. In the dying sunlight, as you know from the loch here, uh, it travelled right across our field of vision in the direction of doors. It sank twice into the water in that three or four minutes. We then thought we had lost it. It came up again and sailed further towards doors, seemed as if it was getting into shallow water, turned, got into the centre loch, and then for the first time it went at full speed ahead with the, a wave and a wash right up the centre loch and away from our view. By now, American scientists had joined the hunt. With them, they brought a yellow submarine and a lot of questions. We are interested in whether we have air breeders or whether we have gilled animals. Now, these two questions can only be answered by determining how long these objects can remain below the surface. If they stay below the surface for more than an hour, we have to assume they can take oxygen from the water. If not, they may or may not be air breathers. If it's an air breather, what do you think it is? Well, if it's an air breather, my best guess is that we have some kind of mammal, possibly a sirenian. Which is what? A sirenian is an animal related to the elephants, but completely aquatic. Now, the kinds we ordinarily hear of are the tropical ones dugongs and manatees, and they're not very large, 10 or 12 feet. But there was a very large uh, sea cow, which Steller discovered in the uh, Bering Strait in 1740, which was about 35 feet long, and would be quite large enough to account for some of the observations here. If it's not an air breather, what is it? Well, if it's not an air breather, we have to think of animals with gills. And probably the, the, the local people here uh, would be right that their guess is that some kind of large, thick-bodied eel might be involved. The yellow submarine had little success and nearly sank twice. There was also a red submarine with a British crew. The hunt for Nessie was on as never before. Surface control, surface control. This is a submarine. The red sub probed the deeps for secret caverns and hidden passageways. Tradition has it the monster has a secret lair near Castle Urquhart, finding its way in and out of the loch through underground waterways that lead to the sea. But even in the deepest, darkest waters of Loch Ness, some 700 feet down, the researchers found little sign of the monster that year. I don't think we found the big um, fault we were looking for. The bottom is certainly quite interesting, but it also seemed to be a bit difficult to maneuver over. On the whole, from our point of view, I'm not worried, ever. <laughs> Quarter of a century later, the Loch Ness submarine continues the search, but still no trace of the monster. But all along the loch, Sightings above the surface have continued, even from the local monastery at Fort Augustus. I wasn't thinking of Nessie at the time, but we had a guest, an eminent organist from Westminster, and I suggested going down to the loch and having a look at the view. We have a magnificent view down the loch from our monastery garden. And we were standing on that jetty, to the stone jetty over there, admiring the view, and now suddenly our eyes 
uh, caught sight of a tremendous agitation in the, in the bay over there to our right. We could see the water being churned up by something, but we couldn't make it out first of all because there was nothing above the surface, but I could see spray being lashed off the surface. Then a few seconds afterwards, believe it or not, we saw this great neck emerge from the water. At least it, uh, about five feet, we estimate, above the water, at an angle, head and neck seem to be one, moving slowly towards the middle of the lock, very rather slowly, uh, for about 20 seconds. We never caught sight of the humps, but this great neck moving along, then it moved down with a sideways kind of motion and disappeared. And we hadn't drunk a drop of whiskey that morning. In 1982, the most ambitious project to date, 150 scientists returned to the loch with more sonar. It operated at depths where normal fish or air-breathing mammals can't survive. There were 40 sonar contacts with unexplained large objects. Investigators were delighted with this picture, apparently showing a large creature diving. Bearing green, 155. It has all the indications of, of being an animal. There's no two ways about that. The other possibilities that we have to explore at the moment are those of inanimate objects, freak sidewall effects. There are a number of other possibilities. But what I can say is that there are no other echoes in the deep water, midwater of Loch Ness, bar these. The underwater map of the loch drawn by sonar. Steep sides and flat bottom. Here the equipment is picking up fish, the little crescent shapes near the surface. Further down, a strong contact with something moving up, then down. Here, a contact dives steeply down to the bottom. Most fascinating of all, sonar traces of two mystery objects at a depth of around 300 feet moving up towards the surface together. What could they be? If these contacts are animals, then these are probably Loch Ness monsters. And if they are not, then there are no Loch Ness monsters in the deep midwaters of Loch Ness. But the evidence you have so far, conclusively, proves to you that there is something there, deep and probably living. It has all the characteristics. Another sonar picked up this contact at some 450 feet down. Suddenly, it dives. Was this diving creature the monster photographed decades before by the Harley Street surgeon? Was it a huge eel, a giant sturgeon, or a big mistake? The controversy has turned Loch Ness into a tourist attraction, fascinating young and old. Loch Ness now has its own exhibition centre and shop. A quarter of a million people come here a year. It survives because of sightings and the reporting of sightings. Now you can't possibly say that all these people are wrong. So they, you know, that's, that's the strength of the whole Nessie story, is people and the new generation coming through, they believe in it too now, yeah? Oh, I hope so, yes. Do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? Yes. What does he look like? Well, he, he's uh, got sharp teeth, but I've uh, got a book of Macy, and in it is like, uh, the Loch Ness Monster is quite friendly. Yeah. Do you think Nessie's friendly? Yes. Do you think you'll see Nessie soon? I hope that he doesn't get caught sometime. Yeah. Myth or reality, Nessie's big business. Scientists have never found the monster, but they've never proved it doesn't exist. Nineteen eighty seven, Operation Deep Scan, a scientific world first. Twenty boats, crewed by investigators from all over the world set out on an epic search for the monster. Each boat was equipped with sonar. Deep Scan created a massive sonar curtain 
which any large creature would find very hard to avoid. A computer map was made of the bottom of the loch. Special care was taken to eliminate false trails caused by sidewall reflection, sonar echoes bouncing back off the walls of the loch. Researchers were looking for a feature which moved. Any sonar contacts with large objects were followed up later to see if they had moved on. the eyes of the world's media upon them, this time researchers like Adrian Schein were more cautious about contacts made in the first few days. I'm not expecting any Jurassic reptiles to emerge, what I call the media monster. I'm not expecting any of those. But the contacts that we have up till now could, could be a fish. They could be a large, very large fish. The most impressive contact by deep scan came not from the flotilla itself, but from a boat travelling behind the line. Suddenly into the view came a quite a large target. Uh, it was sitting off the bottom by a considerable distance, so it wasn't a bottom uh, target. And then we cut the engines and it rose up towards the boat. We, we, we stopped, it still kept coming up and we stayed over it as long as we could. We got a very good picture. It was 480 feet down, just too deep for fish. The deep scan fleet returning to base. Ashore, the world's media awaited them. Strange. So was the strongest signal picked up from a living creature? If so, what was it? With Adrian Schein, two sonar experts from the States. Well, the contact that came off the, the boat that was following behind the line is the contact that uh, is most interesting to me because that boat was behind the line of boats and the, eye, the, the probability of a sidewall reflection off of a protrusion or a ledge reflecting back to the boat following the line and the distance it was in the boats is uh, highly unlikely. Um, the size of the signal at uh, almost 200 meters, uh, to give you an idea, we pick up uh, large fish over wrecks um, at 400 feet is normally kind of the maximum depth that we see uh, a single large uh, depth in a signal like this, and it's generally a large shark, a quite large fish. Um, this is considerably deeper than that. Attempts to repeat this mysterious contact failed. So had the creature moved, or was the reading an error? Deep scan couldn't say for sure. Five years later, the scientists came back in force. 1992, Project Urquhart, a three million pound research project using the latest sonar to gather data on all life in the loch. We're here to do a really comprehensive scientific survey of Loch Ness, of the water, of the loch basin, and of the animals and plants in it. The scientists found no sign of any monster. Not that they were looking for it this time. And this year came news of a crushing blow for believers in the monster. The world famous photo that had started it all turned out to be a hoax. Sixty years ago a surgeon said he took this photo. Proof on film many have since claimed of the existence of Nessie. But now, research to be published in tomorrow's Sunday Telegraph shows the most famous photo of the Loch Ness Monster is a fake. A retired film cameraman, Christian Sperling, admitted shortly before he died that he built a model to persuade the nation the monster existed. This was just a, uh, a small uh, clockwork toy submarine uh, which had a, a model head and neck built up onto the conning tower and then it was uh, photographed at Loch Ness uh, running through the water under its own power. At the Loch Ness Monster Center, however, they say the search for Nessie will continue. The fact is that there are still a thousand odd eyewitnesses who are seeing single humps in Loch Ness uh, and, and allow us to speculate actually about what sort of animals might be involved. 
Local people say this 60-year-old hoax doesn't end the mystery. They believe the legend of the lock will live on, and the fact the picture has been exposed as a fake won't stop people coming to Loch Ness in the hope of catching a glimpse of the monster. Since the hoax was exposed, more visitors have come to Loch Ness than ever before. Controversy attracts tourists, even if some just come for a laugh. What about myths back home? Are you going to be myths back home like Oh, this? yes, we've got the great Tassie Tiger. We spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort looking for the Tassie Tiger. We haven't seemed to have found him yet, but we found a lot of dogs we paint on them. We like to believe in uh, things uh, avoiding our technology in our modern society, modern civilization. But unfortunately, uh, I don't think it can. I want to believe in it because I'm a sort of person that tends to uh, dwell in fantasy. As the animal comes up, this gas has got to be expelled. As the gas is expelled, the animal moves at great speed, and this is what's caused the problem or the big movements that we have seen on the, on, on, on the top of the line. All hot air and hoaxes? Morning. The head of the exhibition centre has no time for sceptics. I was driving into Inverness and uh, it was a beautiful sunny clear day. Uh, the loch was very, very calm. Uh, I stopped the car and there was a, where I saw the disturbance in the water. It was travelling from my left to my right where there was a gap in the trees. I would suspect it would be about 75 yards off the shore. I watched it for about a minute, a minute and a half. Uh, whereby I turned the car round because it had gone out of my vision to my right. Uh, I went down to the next lay-by and by the time I got there, whatever it was in the water had disappeared out of sight. Fortunately for the tourist trade, other locals keep seeing things too. Only recently, Jim Brown and his son James were filming deer when they spotted strange movements on the lake. Their video film was snatched too late to be conclusive, but they have no doubt what they saw with their own eyes. Just see, we're, we're standing by the side of Loch Ness. Uh, this is the 23rd, isn't it? It's the 23rd of August, and we have just seen the Loch Ness monster on the other side of the loch, on, in that bay on the other side. Now, it's a long way away, and uh, James took a couple of shots with the Nikon and a 300mm lens, and I tried to get a shot with the camcorder. Uh, it was very snatched, and uh, it, it, it's not very clear. We'll have to wait and see what comes out. 3.15? The time it was seen was approximately 3.15 in the afternoon. Uh, it'll be interesting to play back and see if we have anything. But without question, there was a huge wake and a swirl when it turned to change direction as a boat came up the loch. And we could see the dark shape ahead of the wake quite clearly. And there's no question of it being anything else. Sightings like these keep the legend alive. But nowadays, investigators have other priorities. Head of the Loch Ness Project, Adrian Shine knows these waters as well as anyone. He's been leading expeditions here since 1980. In the early days, he went monster spotting in an underwater observation chamber. Later equipped with cameras, it never filmed the monster. Shine's never given up, but he's changed focus. Loch Ness, quite apart from the public controversy, is a major and unresearched resource. It is Britain's major lake. It is our greatest volume of fresh water. And we don't really know half as much about it as we ought to. And we are currently involved over the next three years in finding out a very great deal about it. We're going to unpeel it layer by layer from surface to bottom and beneath the bottom. 
The first stage in unpeeling the loch. To check the findings of Sir John Murray, a turn of the century bathometrist who drew up the first detailed map of Loch Ness. Though he never spotted the monster, Sir John spent much time there, taking a total of 1,700 measurements. To do so, he used the highest tech of his day, these specially designed wire sounding machines. The eminent Victorian's measurements have turned out to be accurate to within a few feet, around 750 foot at the deepest point. To Adrian Schein, it's an inspirational example of scientific method. Murray's giant map stretches out for two arm's lengths. The search for the monster and for what it might eat first led investigators to study all life forms in the loch. At 100 feet down, there are big shoals of char. And as deep as 700 feet, and at 5 degrees centigrade, there's another layer of fish life. Scientists still disagree about how many fish there are down here, and whether any monster would have enough to live off. The days of Murray's wire sounding machines are long gone. To draw up their map, Shine and his colleagues from all over the world have been using satellite tracking from Marconi and computers from Sweden. The resulting hydro map is the most accurate ever made of the loch. The bottom is so flat that silt doesn't slump. It just falls and settles, untroubled by changing currents. The result, through time, the sediment is layered, like the rings of a tree. Fertile ground for investigators. Project Rosetta. From the very bottom of the loch, Shine's team extract time capsules of silt, 12 meter long samples of sediment, got by punching deep into the loch's bed. Back at the lab, the time capsules are examined before being sent off to leading British universities. We've just begun to overdrive at that point, haven't we? Yeah. This is a time capsule of events over the last few hundred years. This one represents something like 130 years. Um, you can see events like this, probably this band of clay would be caused by a flood, probably the Great Flood of 1868. Then you have these colour bands, these little couplets of colour, like the rings on a tree. And these could very possibly be annual, if they are, then we have the most exciting prospect of being able to count our way back through time right the way to the last ice age. The Rosetta time machine may also tell us how global warming began and whether it's something we can prevent in the future. And what of the monster? Fact or fiction? Take the place apart and, and you'll have your answer. And what do you think the answer will be? What do you hope it'll be? It would be very nice to think that, uh, that there were a number of unusual things uh, in Loch Ness. Whether they be physical, or biological, or even uh, perhaps psychological. Imagination or reality? Whatever the scientists say, the tourists keep on coming. And some come up with pictures to convince some of the experts. It was a holiday video. The pictures were taken by chance. The man who shot them wanted to avoid publicity. He didn't want to be identified. But he and his friends couldn't explain the pictures taken with this camera. After hours of argument, they made this video available to ITN and the Sun newspaper. The cameraman was at Urquhart Castle on the shore of Loch Ness. He noticed a strange object moving in the water. Too big for a swimmer or diver, 
unlikely to be seals, they are very rarely seen in the fresh water of Loch Ness, possibly waves or the wake of boats. Played in slow motion, a moving black shape can be highlighted. Experts are divided. Some say it's an animal, others are convinced it's a freak wave. Now the object is, looks as if it's the interference pattern of two wakes that have come together and are forming interference between each other, forming what looks like an object but isn't really anything more than just water. I'm amazed by what I've seen. I haven't seen anything like it. I think it's very unusual. I can't see an easy interpretation, but it might well be a large living creature of some sort. Underwater, the Loch Ness submarine continues its quest for whatever creature may be down there. The sub is a key part of the Rosetta project, gathering the core samples from the bottom of the loch. And of course now, tourists can come too. The sub is where science meets tourism. Over the next few years, it'll help decipher just what the early sonar footprints from deep scan might mean. We'll also be studying uh, the mysterious uh, scattering layer at a depth of 100 feet, which is basically a large soup of marine life. And we'll be having a look at that, seeing what it consists of. Yeah. And of course, throughout the whole year, we'll be studying the temperature, the salinity, and a whole range of other things here at Loch Ness. Cynically, are you not just yet another venturer looking for the Loch Ness Monster, which has eluded all these projects in the past? What hope have you got? Well, I'll tell you a little story. A couple of years ago, we were down in Grand Cayman, uh, diving with Natural Geographic magazine, looking for six-gill sharks, which at the time were thought to be extinct. And at a thousand feet, in very, very deep water, very, very dark water, and only in the middle of the night with no moon, we would actually find them. Never in the daytime, never shallower. Now, my own personal theory is that Nessie could well be of a similar ilk. She likes to live deep, live dark, live in cold waters. And the reason that the average person sees her so infrequently, possibly on the surface, is the same as down when we're in the Caribbean, that this particular type of animal doesn't like to come to the surface. So to answer your question directly, I think if anyone's going to find her, possibly we've got as good a chance as anybody. ancient creature unique to the planet, a mirage created by our need for mystery, a fake waiting to be exposed once and for all, or just a very big fish. The Loch Ness Monster will always be with us, because it is all things to all people. We're defending the truth. When you see this thing, you, you have to decide on this issue. Are you going to stand and defend or fight, or are you just going to shrug your shoulders to forget about it? Well, if it's an air breather, my best guess is that we have some kind of mammal, possibly a Cyrenian. A Cyrenian is an animal related to the elephants, but completely aquatic. Now, the kinds we ordinarily hear of are the tropical ones, dugongs and manatees, and they're not very large, 10 or 12 feet. If these contacts are animals, then these are probably Loch Ness Monsters. And if they are not, then there are no Loch Ness Monsters in the deep midwaters of Loch Ness. I've seen a large unidentified object. I've fished here since I was like, quite a young boy and I've never seen anything like it in my life. It just rose out of the water, black, wet, and I yelled at my husband, stop the beast. 